Let me introduce our speaker. Maria Teresa Paludo Silva earned a PhD from the National Autonomous University of Mexico in 2006. She combines ethnobotany and population ecology for the study of non-timber forest products, particularly palms and cicades. Dr. Silva has extensive experience working with indigenous and mestizo use of these products and in, has worked in Colombia, Honduras, Brazil, as well as Mexico. She studies the use of sable palm by Maya people, including population ecology, landscape ecology, and ethnobotanical aspects. Additionally, Maria Teresa has experience studying the gen genus Brahia, the most important palm in the Mesoamerican arid ecosystems. In particular, she's studying the ethnoecology and religious use of Brahia by the Otomi and Mestizo people. On that note, let me turn the screen over to Maria Teresa and we will get this underway. Welcome. And I'm gonna mute my... Thank you, Jim, for introducing me. Um, well, Can you see my screen? Yes, I can, looks good. Okay, thank you. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to speak about the importance of NTFPs in Mexico and their potential for the bioeconomy. Mm, <clears throat> my talk is divided in two parts. First, we go to speak about the general vision about NTFP in Mexico. And the second part is one study case. Photos were taken by me, except where the source is given. Well, non-timber forest products in Mexico are very valuable for many purposes, including, for example, for food or for religion use. Uh, here we have the use of Dacilirium or uh, Mexican Laurel, Litsea, to for, uh, religious use. And um, also, cycads are used uh, as non timber forest products in many ways, um, particularly in religious use. Um, um, but some non-timber forest products are very important in economic terms. For example, a Mexican laurel is produced and harvested in natural forests of uh, Avias religiosa and also is produced and cultivated in wildlife management units uh, supported by Mexican government. Um, it has additional uses um, and because of that, it's very useful. Well, and one of the most important non-timber forest products is Camedora palm that produce many, many money for Mexico and Guatemala because the leaves are um, exported to USA and, and other countries. In general, Mexico uh, has um, a very high diversity um, and Mexico is the fourth uh, uh, country in the world uh, in plant species richness. Uh, but it's not all because Mexico is, has also a uh, very high um, cultural um, diversity. Um, we, are, uh, we have here the um, territory from indigenous people and uh, we need to realize that more than half of Mexican territory is under communal land tenure. Then it's important 
to realize that when we speak about uh, the non-timber forest products. Then um, in Mexico, we, ha we have a, a high biodiversity and also a high traditional ecological knowledge associated with the, the biodiversity of uh, how use the biodiversity. Then how many non-timber forest products are used in Mexico? Well, mm, these authors explain that uh, there are around uh, 1,000 NTFP products and around 5,000 taxa of plants um, used for this purpose. Mm, and another authors give uh, similar numbers. But <clears throat> We need to realize that subsistence is the main role of NTFPs in Mexico and needs to be the priority. Well, how important are the non-timber forest products in Mexico in economic terms? How do they change inside Mexico? And what can we learn about the Mexican case in the bioeconomy Latin American context? Well, the objectives uh, were quantify the volumes of production and income, determining which products, ecosystem, and states hold the greatest potential, and exploring the biological, social, and economic challenge to bioeconomic transition using one case study. Well, first, uh, we need to understand that according to the law, uh, Non-timber forest products, including lichens, uh, mosses, fungi, resins, and mountain soils, and animals are not included. Um, the law explained that um, a harvest permission is required, and uh, the record of that is used in official statistics like statistical yearbooks of forest production. Then um, the non-timber forest products in Mexico um, are regulated by two uh, law, the general wildlife law and the general law of sustainable forestry development, depending of if the species is or not a species with special protection status. Um, uh, if the species is included in the, um, uh, in the list of species with special protection status, the um, environmental ministry gives a permission, uh, but no records uh, are public about that. Uh, in contrast, when, when the species this is, is not included in the list, then only you need a notice of exploitation and the, the environmental ministry provides a permission and um, uh, it is used for input for official statistics. Here I'm going to explain uh, and analyze the official statistics. Mm, then, the official statistics provide the data divided in seven categories according to um, each state and each year. Then the species included um, uh, many, many different species, but um, some of them are agaves. Um, please notice that mountain soil is included like uh, one category and other is another category. Well, uh, go to, to check some agaves. Agave is very useful to many things, of course, but uh, also you can uh, found uh, inside the agaves, the chiniquiles, uh, yeah, and believe me, it's very delicious. Well, um, what about the production? Um, 
the official statistics uh, shows that um, the production change um, al, um, along the time in Mexico, and it is around these values. And um, the economic value is represented in the line. Um, and um, it is in constant dollars. Okay, so um, I think that these numbers uh, are um, low compared with other countries, but we go to uh, compare inside Mexico. Um, NTFP values uh, compared with the GDP from Mexico, NTFP uh, only contributes in a very low value um, and also agriculture and forestry are low. These low values of NTFP reported by official statistics only include data for products for which legal permits for exploitation are granted. Well, in terms um, of volume, um, mountain soils has the biggest value. Uh, and uh, if we disregarding mountain soil, other and resins are very important. Well, in terms of economic value, resins and other are very important um, while mountain soils is uh, uh, marginal because um, mountain soils is cheaper. Well, but what happened inside Mexico? Mexico has um, 32 states. Here we have the top 10 states um, that contribute um, to NTFP production. And the last bar represents the remaining 22 states. Then you can see that Estado de Mexico, Sonora, and Mexico City are the most important places um, to obtain MTFT in Mexico in terms of uh, volume. But many is um, provided by mountain soil represented by gray. Okay, uh, disregarding mountain soil, we can find that um, Michoacán state, Veracruz state, and Tamaulipas are the principal states uh, to contribute uh, to production of NTFP in Mexico. And we can see that uh, Michoacán is the first, and resins um, are resins is uh, are the the main um, product in produced in Michoacán. Resins from Pinus. Then um, Michoacán, um, the Pinus uh, ecosystem is a low diversity ecosystem. Then the, the low ecosystem, the, the ecosystem with low diversity um, has a big importance in Mexico. And uh, we can see that the um, other represented by red is important. However, we don't know uh, what is included in other? Well, in terms uh, of um, to get a complete value of NTFP in Mexico, um, we need not only the official statistics that I show, uh, we also need to include the subsistence economy, the illegal trade, the trade, the trade of a species with special protection status, and we don't have all the information. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Then the analysis of official data demonstrate that uh, some 15 plant taxa are commercially important as NTFPs in Mexico. This is a stark contrast with the 5,000 to 7,000 NTFP providing species now for Mexico. Mm, while about one third of the plant species provide NTFPs, only a low value of species and a low value of the genera have commercial relevance. Therefore, it's clear that NTFPs are underreported in Mexico. An important next step to integrate these products into the bioeconomy will be to develop and employ methods that provide a more valid and reliable estimate of Mexico's annual NTFP harvest and trade values. Well, we go to begin with the second part um, of the talk, but you need to discover which um, non-timber forest product is the study case. Um, it is in the desert, it is harvested in a rustic way. And I suppose that you discovered that I am speaking about Candelilla, Euphorbia antisyphilitica. It's an important plant in the desert. Um, and it, uh, the plant uh, is protected uh, by a wax. Um, and this wax is used for um, many purposes. Uh, the plant is um, available in Mexico and the USA, but only Mexico export raw materials of wild population. And it's one of the main non-timber forest products in Mexico. Well, Candelilla wax, and is innocuous on human skin um, and um, is used since pre-Hispanic times and it has many industrial um, uses, but the first, the, the main is the cosmetic industries. And the international trade is very high uh, and currently there are worries because it is in cities. So um, it requires, or, or there are a regulation um, of the trade of, uh, between countries. Well, the plant is used in many ways hmm? um, for um, industrial purpose. But remember that the, the population are um, harvested from white uh, population. Okay, mm, we made um, um, a work in two sites uh, of uh, the north of Mexico. Uh, and we began with a workshop uh, with the Candelilla growers. And they explained many things about the works uh, of Candelilla. For example, um, they explained that the plant uh, is, um, is very abundant in canyons and in the mesas or flat area close to the mountain, but the plant is not present in the lowlands um, or bajos. And uh, the plant is not harvested in the mountain because it's uh, very difficult. And then we made um, a study uh, including 20 plots by place and um, local people and, uh, and a team of students uh, helped to do the, the, the research and we found um, that the plant is abundant, um, that the regeneration rate is, uh, is good. Um, so there are not um, um, biological problem. Mm, 
for example, um, we found that um, the plant, uh, well, the, the, um, the people harvest uh, using a permission. Um, the permission include many, uh, many quantities. And the, the candelilla growers harvest important quantities, uh, but the, the final numbers um, is uh, the final numbers are inside the per, uh, the approved uh, permissions. Okay. The problem or the challenge is um, the harvest because um, and the processing because um, here we have how the plant is processed. The candelilla growers need to um, carry the plant to a place called Campo Candelillero. Hmm? And um, they process the plant because they need to boil in water and they apply sulfuric acid to release the wax. And then, <laughs> They are jumping uh, in boiled water. It's very dangerous. Um, and finally, they get the wax. But first, uh, but we need to understand that only 3% of the total weight uh, is uh, harvested uh, in wax. And uh, many are waste. So, um, it requires, uh, the candelilla requires technological research to optimize wax extraction and improve work conditions. Um, here we have the plant um, before a process and behind you can see mountains of plants uh, after the process. So we have many waste. Um, that waste has a huge potential for, um, um, for bioeconomy because uh, it is a, a it, it includes many cellulose and many products. So it's an opportunity. Well, um, here we have um, a summary of the life of candelilla growers. We have the, uh, 13 candelilla growers and each cell represents one year uh, in the life of that people. And um, in, in black, you can see the time when they work in Candelilla. And um, we can see that um, many of them, uh, no, all of them began to work when they were uh, children. And uh, some of them um, continue working when they are very old because it's, it is, um, Mm, it is an uh, uh, opportunity for them uh, when they don't get another type of uh, work, they go to work in Candelilla. So um, they say that it's a, it's a good uh, work because uh, they said, I am my own boss. Okay. Um, in the... In the final part, I'm going to speak about some implication for the bioeconomy. Mm, in this chart, we can, um, we can uh, see the um, interventions that exist in, Mexican, in Mexico using many plants uh, to produce bioplastic, biofuel, biodiesel, uh, and you can see that it's um, the bioeconomy um, in Mexico is uh, 
it has a technological approach. Uh, following these uh, authors' uh, terminology, the current approach of the bioeconomy in Mexico resemble a technological bioresource approach, um, rather than a socio-bioresource approach emphasizing uh, the poverty, the resource sustainability, and the secondary processing. Well, in the context of Latin America, Rodriguez made um, uh, analyze that the uh, bioeconomy contribute in an average of 24% of national level exports, but only 8% for Mexico. Uh, the same author, Rodriguez, um, explained that uh, many things are required in Latin America, including the development of suitable regulate, regulatory frameworks, the coordination of scientific and technological capacities, the promotion of small and medium businesses, and the financing creation of innovative companies in the bioeconomy. Um, and I suggest also include, for example, promoting social enterprise, develop, developing local capacity and a faded economic relations between growers and intermediaries. Okay, um, some take home message are that the um, official statistics needs to be reformed to provide more valid information. For example, remember the other that I explained. Only 15 taxa are of recognized economic importance and legally traded, most of which are found in low biodiversity ecosystem. Mm, developing efficient processing technologies and maintaining forest cover are crucial. Forest-based bioeconomy projects in Mexico are focused on the generation of fuels, energy, and alternative to plastics. And one of the biggest challenge is the transition from techno bioresource to a socio bioresource approach. Okay, thank you. And the uh, questions are welcome. Very good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wonder very interesting. We've got that was very interesting, I have to say. One of the questions, oh, let me start my video now. Um we have several questions we're working on translations one of the questions that i have is this other category and how do we get to uh understand what's in that other category i see that as a pervasive challenge across the world when we're talking about non-timber forest products and i'd like to hear your thoughts and What's in there? It's, it's such an important part of the picture. And how do we get more information on that, on that piece of information? Yes. Um, one of the problem is that um, we, don't, um, we don't have all the picture because um, we know that there are a lot of uh, products included as uh, NTFPs, but uh, we don't have um, disaggregated data. And it's a big problem because um, um, we can't uh, take many decisions uh, because it's very wide category. Uh, particularly in Mexico and Latin America uh, where we have many, many species. Uh, then, um, at least in Mexico, um, I know that exists the information, 
but it's not public. Mm -hmm. Then um, it's a big challenge that um, is required to share the information, to analyze and, and get uh, the general tendencies. Yeah, that's such a that's such a big challenge globally. But how do you get that information out? Um, I'm going to direct your attention to the uh, Q and A box, and if you look in the answered uh, section, you'll see some questions that have popped up. Uh, I think they're in there uh, in the translation. Um, but let me just read a couple that I see. Uh, for first of all, uh, Felix uh, asks. Are NTFP plant species being used or promoted in agroforestry systems, or are, is it all wild harvested? So I guess the question is, are, are we moving from wild harvested to actually a production systems? Yes, um, it depends. Some and uh, some NTFPs are harvested only in wild environments. Um, but um, generally when the demand is so high, then um, the people um, begin to produce in agroecosystems. Uh, it's the case, for example, from uh, Camedora. Uh, there are different um, agroecosystems uh, modified and management by people um, to increase the production of camedora because they, uh, they transform the forest, uh, management the forest and uh, put the camedora uh, low and in the, in the canopy, uh, there are the the forest, the original forest, but the in the in the low part of the forest is a uh, camedora. Then, um, yes, we we have uh, different uh, situations uh, depending of the demand, depending of the land use uh, of the the territory. There's a question in there uh, in the answer. A box, and you might look at that uh, from Kyle. And it, it is in Spanish, so I'll let you uh, take a look at that. If you can see that, let me know if you cannot. Mm, I can see Kyle only said Fuente or Source, but I can find the question. It's in the answered section. I am looking in the question and as well uh, part. It's okay. You should see a, you should see a box in there, the column that says answered. Uh, no, I'm not able to translate it. Ah, in que consiste el suelo de montaña? Is turba o otra fuente orgánica o es mineral? Ah, it's asking about the mountain soil. Um, Mountain soil is um, the, the only the, the earth, the material uh, by this composition of uh, bioorganic uh, uh, things, and is uh, uh, useful uh, for gardening, and uh, is uh, very important in um, in tons but not important in the money. Uh, and that's all, it's only the, the material uh, of, uh, of mat uh, organic material, the decomposition of organic material, yes. Uh, so it's used for gardening and farming? Yes. Okay. Uh, Florencia asks the question, Maria Teresa, Thank you for your talk. You mentioned that indigenous peoples hold most of the knowledge of NTFPs and are important for their subsistence livelihoods, which I agree and the literature supports. Do you know how much of the official permits to economic exploitation of NTFP are granted to indigenous peoples? Mm. 
not many not many are um, given to indigenous people mm, be, um, many of the um, local well in, in general the the um, the local use of NTFPs mm, don't require um, permission mm, in Mexico. You need a permission only when you go to, to sell the NTFP, but um, it could be uh, only a small quantity or uh, you require um, a permission. Um, or, or a big quantity, but um, many, I know, uh, I know that many indigenous people ask, ask for permission when they have uh, religious um, festivities. Mm -hmm. Then um, they ask for the uh, use of different uh, plants, um, but uh, there are many different situations. Sometimes uh, they get the permissions and sometimes not. And uh, because, uh, not because they don't uh, uh, get the permission, uh, instead they, um, um, it's difficult for, they, for them uh, obtain uh, all the requirements and um, and finally the time is over and uh, they need to have the plants uh, in some in, for, in some specific uh, day and finally sometimes they um, decide the substitution um, of the plant by another a product by another uh, material, for example, paper or, or another thing. Hmm? So it's very different, different things. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Charles asked a question, <clears throat> excuse me, is agave becoming more important because of the increasing export of alcohol products? No, could you repeat please? It's in the answered uh, box, and it says, is agave becoming more important because of the increasing export of alcoholic products? So agave is used in uh, tequila and other liquor, and so there's an increased demand uh, for for those liquor and alcohol products and he's wondering is is it is the value from mexico increasing uh yeah it is agave becoming more and more important because of the increasing export of alcoholic, alcoholic products mm. oh, well um there are different reasons. Uh, one of the of the reason is is that um, now there are um, um, increasing exportation of uh, of agave products, and um, at at the same time um, there are. Um, uh, um, there, there is decreasing the land um, cover with agave mm -hmm. um, in general. So uh, there are uh, um, a high, um, there are a very high demand, but uh, no very high uh, cultivation. Uh, for example, um, not for a colleague uh, purpose, but um, uh, I live in in the central part of Mexico. Uh, here there are many uh, agave plants, but um, uh, here is used for handicraft. 
and um, uh, it's incredible because <laughs> because it, it's um, uh, it has been harvested for a long time ago, and currently they don't have the material. They don't have the the raw material, and they need to import or, or carry the the plant from the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, another agave, agave fruit croides, they get the, the material and make the handicraft here. But we are in the land of, <laughs> of the agave. So it's a, it's a it's tremendous result. Interesting, huh? <clears throat> it's very widespread, I imagine. Agave is found everywhere, huh? So Richard asked a question, are there any estimates of the income generated from NTFPs per household or in general? Do you have an idea of how, what proportion of their family income comes from non-timber products? Yes, um, there are some estimated, um, but not enough. Um, it is one of the biggest um, challenge in research because we have uh, in some towns, in some small areas, we have estimates about uh, the importance of uh, NTFP for household, but, um, but we can't understand the, the general impact in Mexico. And it's very important, but uh, I don't know how <laughs> how get them the data because we need uh, uh, we need a, a different approach to have a better idea. Yeah, that's that's a real challenge everywhere. Is how we know it's important to the households. We know that households rely on these products, but there's really not enough data to tease out how, how exactly what the estimate or how much income they are generating. Uh, our friend from, from Spain, Sven Mutke, asks a particular question about um, the any data or approximate volume and value of uh, piña, rosa, mm -hmm. pine nuts in Mexico. So, yeah. you know, in Spain, that's a really important product. In Portugal, that's very important. Even here in the United States and in Mexico, I'm sure. Um, have you looked at that or do you have, is there data out there on that? Well, I, I don't know. Probably mm, there is information, I don't know. But uh, please, um, please email me. Uh, probably I can get some information. Mm -hmm. That seems to be, uh, we see that uh, in Latin America, our colleagues down there are working on, on pine nuts and, and Spain and Portugal, and the United States and even Mexico. It seems like a very important product that we should be able to get a handle on, on the uh, data that's out there on that. Yes, for example, here in, uh, I live in Hidalgo, uh, we have an important population of Pinus symbroides. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know the, the availability of data. Uh, I have to check. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Uh, Richard has a, a couple questions. Um, are there stakeholders such as NGOs or private sector uh, government that are supporting the communities that you've been looking at to to help improve their livelihood with with NTFPs. Mm, yes, in Mexico, um, I think that uh, um, one of the characteristics in Mexico is uh, the existence of many, or not, I don't know, of many, but. The, but good and <laughs> NGOs uh, that support many communities, um, particularly in 
regions like Oaxaca, Chiapas, uh, but uh, yes, there are many support, but of course, uh, more things are required, particularly um, about the land, the land um, tenure, hmm? um, because, um, well, because currently um, the land, the communal land can be sold and many people uh, has problems um, uh, because the land uh, itself and uh, there are many many legal problems associated so it's uh, more uh, it required more and more uh, support uh, to indigenous people very good uh, let's see i'm gonna have to catch up here oh helena uh, asks a question and she says thank you very much for the presentation wonderful wonderful job are there other national policies in Mexico that are aiming to stimulate the production and trade of wild products? Could you speak to that, the policies that focus on the trade of wild harvested products? Um, she said, goes on, apart from the LGDFS or LGBS that you spoke of, for example, in Brazil, they have the national policy of socio-biodiversity products. And she's wondering what are the main ones in Mexico related to sort of wild wild products? Could you speak to that? Mm -hmm. mm, I think, uh, well, mm, I want to um, explain that um, the law don't stimulate the production or trade of NTF-free products, only regulate, but not stimulate. I, I think uh, um, in the Mexican case, the, um, the rules are very um, extreme uh, or very rude for, uh, for people, for local people. Um, and uh, um, um, there are some uh, over regulation i think uh, there are over oh, there is over regulation in the laws in mexico related with ntfps over regulation when we are speaking about the local people and the regulation is very easy when we speak uh, or think in commercial scale. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, um, uh, uh, in Mexico, there are not um, programs that support or stimulate, like in Brazil, uh, is, is um, it's a challenge here. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Richard uh, asked a question earlier about um, stakeholders and private sector people work supporting the communities. He had an additional question. So what about access to markets for these communities? Um, do they have access to the markets and how does that work? Or is that a challenge for them? or? Could you speak to that a little bit about sort of how, did, how are communities able to access markets and is that a inhibit, does that inhibit their, their uh, possibilities, I suppose? Well, um, there are different situations in Mexico. Some indigenous communities has access to international markets, and uh, they are um, they are um, a big example for for the world. Um, for example, they produce many coffee, um, organic coffee, and many another uh, associated products. 
um, and they export to Europe and uh, it's, it's so nice because they has they have uh, the the um, organization, mm -hmm. but uh, but uh, it's not uh, <laughs> it's not uh, always the case. We have um, uh, many cases where the people is in local markets and they only have a, a small um, a small income and uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, however, there are some uh, <laughs> some I, I am thinking in in, um, in the another question um, because uh, mm, there are some government support. For example, um, the CONAFOR, Comisión Nacional Forestal, the uh, Forestry Commission, uh, they, they provide um, um, technical assistance to produce and to market some products and they help uh, in a small uh, scale, they help uh, some efforts uh, local efforts to commercialization. Interesting. Uh, Helena asks another question, and I see that if you if you get into the answered uh, column and you click on show all, you'll see the uh, Spanish translation. I just realized that it's it's there. Uh, I'll, I can read it in English, and if you can look at the uh, Spanish translation, that might help you as well. But uh, Helena says, are there uh, any labels or certification schemes for products that are more spread, well, well known in Mexico? So she's interested in uh, certification and uh, schemes to you know, uh, deal with certified products. Um. I don't. I don't remember. Uh, I think that there are not um, certification schemes inside Mexico. Uh, no, only uh, there are um, some uh, international certification. And some of the people can get that. But not inside Mexico, not in an official way. Um, um, I I only remember that, for example, the Oaxaca, uh, the people from Oaxaca, in the south of Mexico, uh, they work, <laughs> they work together. Uh, and they sell their products in, I think, in all the republic. Uh, you can find small cards, uh, Oaxaca products, or, and you can uh, buy that. It's not a certification, but it's a, it's a web that they made. Hmm? And you identify this like... Uh, like a um, product uh, very very good very, uh, with a, with a important quant uh, quality and uh, but um, I I think that there are not certification schemes hmm? not uh, specific. Hmm? Perhaps that's an opportunity for transitioning towards a bioeconomy is to look at the possibilities for certifying the products. Sure. Yes. I have a question. In one of your early slides, you spoke of a particular uh, plant product that was being exported to the United States and other countries, and its value was something like $27 million. Do you recall what was that plant, and do you, 
do you recall that? It's one of the Camedora. early slides. Camedora? Uh, the Might. Camedora Palm? Mm. Might be. What is that used for? Uh, uh, the leaves are used for ornamental purpose in the USA. Uh -huh. Yes. It's very important. Yes. Yeah. Huh. Does it do damage to the plant when it's harvested? Is I there think no. No. Is it just, are, it's just the leaves? Um, mm, not because, I think uh, it's not uh, um, dangerous for the plant um, because there are um, many agricultural uh, systems uh, where the plant is introduced. And then the demand uh, is supplied by different sources, not only white populations. But um, at the same time, there are um, um, some works that uh, made um, experimental um, to, uh, to understand uh, the, the ecological effects on the plant. And uh, yes, when the plant is over harvest, um, the fecundity values uh, decrease and um, sometimes the mortality increase. So, uh, so uh, then, um, yes, it, it has um, consequences depending of uh, how do you uh, harvest the plant. Mm, but at the same time, uh, we have an uh, agricultural plot where, where the plant is introduced. Interesting. Huh. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Maria and Teresa. That was very informative. I really appreciate your effort today. Um, it was wonderful. I hope everybody else enjoyed it as much as I did.